we use the alveolar gas equation to calculate what the pressure of the alveolar oxygen is. This equation makes a lot of sense because basically all you're doing is saying that your oxygen that you bring in, so the pressure of the inspired oxygen, minus the oxygen that leaves will be equal to whatever oxygen is in the alveoli. Let's draw the oxygen going into the alveolus. Before we get too ahead of ourselves, I just want to clarify a couple things about this. First being that this PaO2 that we are trying to calculate refers to the amount of oxygen in the alveolus after some amount of gas exchange has occurred. If we wanted to know the pressure of the oxygen in the alveolus immediately after we inspire, this would be a much simpler equation. It would just be this term because at least temporarily, after you take a breath of this air in, your alveolar tension will be exactly what this pressure of inspired O2 is. But of course, we will have some amount of O2 leaving. We don't know how much yet. And we're more interested in the state of this alveoli after some of this gas exchange has occurred and the oxygen has left, which is why we're doing the O2 in minus our O2 out. This term of O2 that leaves the alveoli is calculated based on the predictable relationship of how much CO2 is produced compared to how much O2 is consumed. Which brings me to my other important point here, which is that this calculation needs to be in a patient at steady state, meaning that all of the CO2 that's being produced is leaving the patient at the same rate. And I'll show what happens if you try to use this equation when that condition is not met and how you'll have an inaccurate result. Lastly, before we get into the meat of the equation, I just want to do some housekeeping about this first term, which is the pressure of inspired O2. Sometimes you'll see it written as this. This is your O2 in. Just saying that the pressure of water vapor has to be subtracted from your barometric pressure before you uh, multiply this by the FiO2. Let's say we have this column of air here with 21% oxygen, as is in room air. This entire column is going to be 760 millimeters of mercury at sea level. That's the barometric pressure. If you breathe this in, as it passes through your airways, it's heated to 37 degrees Celsius and humidified. So this water vapor with a vapor pressure of 47 millimeters of mercury is added to this gas column. So this entire column of air, or the, the air that you're breathing still has to be one atmosphere or 760 millimeters. So it's actually just gonna dilute the oxygen and the other gases. So instead of your oxygen being 21% of that entire column, now it's slightly less. And then we have this segment of water or water vapor, I should say. This is now diluting your original 21% of oxygen. Therefore, we need to account for this when we uh, calculate an accurate inspired pressure of oxygen. So here we would say 760 millimeters of mercury minus 47, which is the water, times 0 0.21 gives us 150 millimeters of mercury. So this will be our PiO2. And again, that's because this water vapor has diluted the O2 down from what was originally 160 millimeters of mercury. Okay, so now we know that our inspired oxygen pressure is 150 millimeters of mercury. And when we bring that in, we can say that we start with 150 millimeters of mercury of O2, which is our O2 in. Some unknown amount of this oxygen is going to leave and then go on to the tissue. In the tissue, your oxygen is converted to CO2 as a byproduct at a ratio of one to 0 0.8. This 0 0.8 is your respiratory quotient and the precise ratio of conversion of O2 to CO2 depends on your diet. 
So depending on if you have more carbs or more fats in your diet, this could go up or down a little bit. In general though, with a mixed diet, we can say that this RQ will be about 0.8. And then this CO2 is going to end up back in our circulation. It will exert a certain tension in the arterial circulation. And we know from previous that the arterial CO2 tension is going to be the same as our alveolar CO2 because the diffusion is so rapid with CO2 that these will essentially be identical. So now this is interesting because we've ended up with 40 millimeters of mercury of CO2 in our alveolus. So we can figure out more or less how much oxygen must have left this alveolus in order to be uh, converted to CO2 and returned to the alveolus at this amount. So if we have 40 of CO2, we must have had 50 of oxygen leaving and being transformed into CO2 in your tissue. At steady state, that's basically the only thing that makes sense because if it was more oxygen that left and was metabolized than 50, you would see a higher return than 40 millimeters of mercury of uh, CO2. So now we can say that our O2 out is 50 millimeters of mercury. Now we can take our 150 that we brought in and subtract the 50 millimeters of mercury that must have left the alveoli in order to bring this amount of CO2 back in. And that equals a PaO2, or resulting alveolar tension of oxygen of 100 millimeters of mercury. Recall that basically the whole reason we're doing this was so that we'd be able to calculate the AA gradient and narrow down our differential for hypoxemia. Actually, this patient isn't even hypoxemic. We're just going to be able to see if they have an AA gradient. This person has a PaO2 of 100 millimeters of mercury, which we've calculated using the alveolar gas equation. Let's say we measure a PaO2 of 95 on the ABG, which, by the way, is very typical for someone breathing room air and has healthy lungs. So 100 minus 95 gives us an AA gradient of 5 millimeters of mercury. And anything less than 15 is normal, so this person has a normal AA gradient, meaning that this patient does not have any issues with shunting or uh, diffusion impairment from the alveolus to his uh, pulmonary capillaries. Just so you're comfortable with this calculation, I want to show you quickly what will happen with hyperventilation or hypoventilation while you're at steady state. When you're hyperventilating, you'll be bringing a certain amount of O2 in, and let's say we're still on room air. So from our previous PiO2 calculation, we know we're bringing in 150. Some currently unknown amount of oxygen will leave and go on to your tissue where it's converted to CO2 at a ratio of about 1 to 0 0.8. Our CO2 will go back to our circulation. We're going to measure a PaCO2 of 30 millimeters of mercury here. And that also means that our alveolar tension will equilibrate at 30 as well. So now we know we've sent 30 CO2 back, therefore we must have converted 37 0.5 of O2 to maintain this ratio and the oxygen that was sent out is 37.5 millimeters of mercury. The PaO2 or the alveolar tension of oxygen is then the original 150 that we brought in minus the 37.5 that left and was metabolized. So we end up with 112.5 millimeters of mercury of O2. Let's suppose this patient has a PaO2 of 117.5 millimeters of mercury now on their ABG, giving them the same AA gradient of 5 millimeters of mercury.
I think the difference between the PaO2 here for hyperventilation and when you're breathing at more of a normal rate is actually interesting because you'll often think you're not really making much of a difference to your oxygenation by breathing faster, but it does actually change a little bit. And sure, it's a very modest increase in your PaO2 by breathing quite a bit more, but by increasing your respiratory rate, you're constantly washing fresh oxygen that has this 150 millimeters of mercury of tension into the alveoli. So you're kind of holding it closer to this 150 with each breath and therefore your uh, resulting alveolar oxygen tension will be slightly higher and your PaO2 will be slightly higher when you're hyperventilating. Let's look at what might happen if you're hypoventilating. Let's say you're still on room air, so you breathe in that 150 of O2. Some currently unknown amount of oxygen will leave and this O2 will go to your tissue where it is converted to CO2 at a ratio of about 1 to 0 0.8. Our CO2 will come back and can be measured in the blood. And let's say that our CO2 tension is 60 millimeters of mercury. That of course will be the same as the CO2 tension in the alveolus, which is what we actually care about. And so if we're bringing 60 back and eliminating that with this breath, we know that about 75 of oxygen was used to create that CO2. So this amount of oxygen that must have left the alveoli is 75 millimeters of mercury. Your resulting alveolar O2 tension will be the original 150 that you brought in minus 75 that you lost equaling 75 millimeters of mercury. And let's just say that this is the same patient as before and since all we've changed about him is the fact that now he's hypoventilating a little bit, nothing else about his physiology is any different. So we'll say that he has the same AA gradient. Just making that assumption from previous. And then we can say that his PaO2, if we were to measure it, would probably be 70. This, surprisingly, actually is still a respectable PaO2. Remember we said our cutoff for hypoxemia was 60 millimeters of mercury, which corresponds to a saturation of 90%. So you're gonna be satting over 90% still here, even though you're only ventilating enough to keep your PaCO2 at 60. This is sort of interesting because it demonstrates that in the absence of any other lung issues like shunt or diffusion problems, people would be relatively resistant to hypoxemia with what we would consider hypoventilation alone. So when you see people that are hypoxemic and hypoventilating a little bit, it's almost always a mixed issue with something else going on like a shunt. If you don't have time to calculate the alveolar oxygen tension, you can still pick out some trends that would exist um, from this equation. If you have increased arterial CO2 concentration, that's a sign that you either have high O2 consumption or you're not ventilating that um, CO2 off well enough. So you would look at your vent settings and decide if you think that you are uh, getting enough alveolar ventilation then kind of an extension of this, if you have hugely increased PaCO2, that's likely always associated with hypoxemia. I should add, unless you're at an increased FiO2, which is actually most of the time that you're using a ventilator. By bringing a larger amount of oxygen into the alveoli with each breath. So let's say 100% oxygen, more or less. Hopefully this is enough to compensate for the increased metabolic needs of the patient or your uh, low ventilation rate. Another thing you could pick out from the numbers on your ABG is that a low PaCO2 
in association with a low PaO2 probably means that you have a shunt, either intracardiac or intrapulmonary or diffusion abnormality being your high AA gradient. Because if you have managed to lower your PaCO2, you're probably ventilating enough. So low ventilation is not the reason for your low arterial oxygen concentration. Lastly, for any of these assumptions to be true or for the equation to be true, you need your system or patient to be at steady state. All of these are invalid assumptions because the equation is invalid. So that means that it is inaccurate at induction where you've gone from a steady breathing rate to dropping down your ventilation again and then putting the patient on the ventilator to again change their respiratory rate um, or really anything that would cause acute changes to your ventilation status. So unless you manage to hold oxygen consumption and minute ventilation exactly the same all throughout your induction, if you were to draw an ABG right after the patient's put to sleep, um, you wouldn't really be able to use that to inform you about an AA gradient. Um, and then if you are to hold the patient on stable vent settings and establish a new baseline um, PaCO2 for those vent settings, then you can consider doing the alveolar gas equation. So it's accurate on stable vent settings.